the central dogma. Before we get into the details, let's think about the overall picture. Enzymes, mostly proteins, carry out all of the functions of the cell. You need to remember how to make these proteins, so you need to store these recipes somehow. You also need the biological machinery to take the recipes you have stored and convert them into proteins. Finally, if you are going to make more copies of your life form, you need a way to replicate this DNA. So, you need a recipe book that makes proteins. These proteins carry out all the reactions of the cell, and a subset of these reactions make a copy of the recipe book. In the process of making these proteins, Francis Crick proposed that the cell transcribes the DNA into RNA and then translates the RNA into protein. He called this process the central dogma. How does the DNA sequence direct protein synthesis? The central dogma starts with the DNA, so let's look at a DNA coding region. Here we have methionyl tRNA synthetase, MET-S, that is responsible for adding the amino acid methionine to the methionine tRNA. If you look at this gene in the DNA, it would appear to be long strings of A, T, and G, C. So how does the cell know where to start? It turns out there's a hidden language in the DNA. The letters A, G, C, and T are arranged into words that the cell machinery recognizes. The various words are DNA sequences that indicate where to start transcription, a promoter, where to stop transcription, a terminator, where to start translation, a star codon, and where to stop translation, a stop codon, and various three-letter words for each amino acid. Each of these sequences has enough complexity, at least in context, to not appear randomly by chance. Thus, the cell transcription and translation machinery won't initiate transcription or translation at incorrect spots on the DNA. To make things easier to understand, scientists have labeled the DNA of each organism and come up with conventions for talking about its structure. A gene is an area of DNA that is transcribed and most often translated to a macromolecule that serves a function in the cell. Each gene transcript will have a promoter and a terminator. Genes can be transcribed by themselves, monocystronic, or they can be transcribed into larger mRNA containing several genes, polycystronic. An operon is a region of DNA that encodes a series of genes involved in a certain function. The DNA before the 5' side of a region is termed upstream, and the DNA past the 3' region of interest is the downstream region. Bacterial and archaeal genomes are almost all genes. There is minimal non-coding sequence. However, there is more non-coding sequence in eukarya, sometimes much more. For example, the human genome is 3.3 billion nucleotides, but only about 2% of it encodes coding sequences. Transcription is the first step in moving from DNA to protein. RNA polymerase is the leading player in this process. The process is called transcription because the language is not really changing. DNA base sequence to RNA base sequence is all nucleotides. Shown on this figure is an actual X-ray crystal structure of the E. coli RNA polymerase. So some general thoughts and things to understand about transcription. RNA polymerase carries out transcription, which recognizes promoters with its sigma subunit. The sigma subunit makes contact with the DNA and recognizes a consensus sequence. The promoter strength is dictated by how well sigma binds to the DNA, which in turn depends on how closely it matches the consensus sequence. 
different sigma factors will recognize different promoters around the chromosome and this can be a major point of regulation. The most common sigma factor, sigma 70, also has the most promoters around the genome. RNA polymerase structure. RNA polymerase from E. coli has five subunits, alpha, beta, beta prime, omega, and sigma. E. coli contains about 2,000 copies of RNA polymerase per cell. As we discussed in the lectures on cell structure, RNA polymerase from archaea and eukarya is different, containing at least 13 subunits. Eukarya also have three different RNA polymerases. Right now, we're going to focus on transcription in bacteria. There are several steps in transcription. First, recognition by the promoter, which involves the binding of the sigma factor. Then, the open complex is formed, where the DNA strands are separated. RNA polymerase then begins inserting bases into the DNA, trying each one randomly and inserting the correct one when it finds a match and starts creating the transcript. Finally, transcription continues in the elongation phase until the polymerase reaches a terminator. Shown in this diagram is a little animation of the process. First you have initiation, the sigma factor binds, sometimes it falls out. Then you have elongation. And finally, you'll have termination, and this shows a row independent terminator, which we'll cover in a second. Recognition in bacteria. Recognition of a promoter in bacteria involves the binding of a sigma factor. For example, sigma 70 recognizes the primno box shown above. This identification is a specific molecular interaction where sigma is making contact with the bases in the DNA sequence in the major and minor grooves. After recognition, RNA polymerase then transitions to the open complex, creating a 12 base pair loop in the DNA, and then starts inserting nucleotides. Elongation then proceeds out from the open complex in a five prime to three prime direction. Bases are added one at a time, again, being picked randomly out of the solution. The rate of RNA polymerase is 45 base pairs per second, which is much slower than DNA polymerase, but this matches the speed of translation. After inserting about 20 nucleotides, sigma may fall out of the complex. In any stretch of DNA, there are two strands. One strand is the template strand. This is what RNA polymerase tests each nucleotide against. The other is the coding strand. This DNA strand is what is being copied. The mRNA transcript will have the same sequence as the coding strand. Of course, except U replaces T in the RNA. Genes upstream or downstream may use a different strand as the template. Note how in the lower figure, RNAs AM is using the top strand as the coding strand while TRIP e uses the bottom strand as the coding strand. Termination in bacteria can occur in two ways. In row independent termination, there is a terminator sequence. This DNA sequence encodes an inverted repeat that can hybridize with itself. And this is followed by a long run of A's. When RNA polymerase translates the terminator into RNA, a hairpin loop forms, and this secondary structure will destabilize the RNA polymerase DNA complex by pulling at it. The run of U's weakly interacts with the DNA template, and thus the RNA falls off. In row-dependent termination, the row protein binds to a rut site on the RNA but only if the ribosome is not actively translating a section of messenger RNA. In other words, there has to be an open stretch of mRNA. These rut sites have a high amount of cytosine and not much guanine, but there is no consensus on their sequence. Rho, hydrolyzing ATP as it goes, chases down the RNA polymerase, but can only catch it if polymerase stalls. 
Rho then disrupts the RNA DNA helix, releasing the polymerase. So there's two forms of termination in E. coli, Rho independent termination and Rho dependent termination. Many genes in bacteria are polycystronic, meaning more than one gene is transcribed at a time. Often these operons will encode genes that are all involved in the same process. For example, the catabolism of lactose or the biosynthesis of histidine. That's the process of transcription in bacteria. Overall, it is very similar in other domains, but there are differences. The table above summarizes them. Let's go through some specifics. Creating RNA from DNA by using a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase is a function that all living things must do. It's no surprise that the RNA polymerase shares homology between even distantly related organisms. There is a set of five core enzymes shared among them. These are shown in the table and you can also see it in the structures. However, archaea and eukarya have more subunits, one function of which is to deal with histones that the DNA is tightly wrapped around in both these sets of organisms. Eukarya has even specialized to the point of having three RNA polymerases. RNA polymerase 1 focuses on transcribing ribosomal RNA. RNA polymerase 3 focuses on transfer RNA and a few other non-coding RNAs. RNA polymerase 2 transcribes a wide variety of RNA, including messenger RNA. Another key difference between bacteria and archaea eukarya is that the bacterial RNA polymerase will recognize its promoter directly, as we said, using a sigma factor. In contrast, auxiliary proteins that are not part of the RNA polymerase carry out this function in the other two domains. Tata binding protein binds to the Tata site. Well, duh. And transcription factor B recognizes BRE, or B recognition element, in the DNA. Once bound, these pro two proteins recruit RNA polymerase to the site. Archaea and eukarya also have introns in their DNA, and enzymes splice them out during protein expression. In eukaryotic systems, a 5' cap and a poly A tail are also added during this mRNA synthesis. Okay, that's it for transcription. Let's now move on to translation.